Thank you for downloading this episode of In Our Time. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk slash radio4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In antiquity, the Greek lyric poet Sappho was known as the Tenth Muse, or as Sappho the Wise, where Homer was the poet, Sappho was the poetess. She was as prolific as she was celebrated. Her work filled nine papyrus rolls in the Alexandra Library. Today, <coughs> it's thought less than 1% of Sappho's poetry remains. Even so, she's been a significant influence on literature since the, Ren- sorry. <coughs> since the Renaissance and an inspiration to many, struck by the vividness of her writing and the way she describes her desires, often for other women. Just as little of her verse remains, so we know few hard facts about her, but rarely a new fragment of papyrus is discovered, (coughs) as it was recently by one of our guests, giving us more of her poetry and some tantalising personal details. I have to take a glass of water, sorry about this. We can't add that time on, unfortunately. With me to discuss Sappho are Edith Hall, Professor of Classics at King's College London, Margaret Reynolds, Professor of English at Queen Mary, University of London, and Dirk Obink, Professor of Papyrology and Greek Literature at the University of Oxford and Fellow and Tutor at Christchurch College, Oxford. Edith Hall, how important was the island where Sappho lived, Lesbos? Lesbos was a, a prominent and prosperous island in the eastern Aegean, very close to what is now the Tur- Turkish seaboard. Um, it had been very important for many centuries because it was a, an important trading place. It was known as a place where particularly beautiful women came from. We know that women ended up um, from the island of Lesbos as commodities in, in Mycenaean Greece. And it had very strong contacts with the early civilizations of Anatolia, like the Hittites, and in Sappho's time, the very wealthy Lydian kingdom. So it's tr- easily stretched back to pre the pre-Greek times. Very much so. And one of the exciting things about having a poet from the late 7th century uh, BC, a Greek poet from that time, is that her poetry shows the sort of hybrid nature of the, civil- the culture on her island. It's very different from the mainland Greek culture. And her language is, is full of allusions to the exotic empires of the East and indeed interesting exotic items of vocabulary. Can we talk about Lesbos in two ways? First of all, how the island was like Greece and how it was unlike Greece at the time? Well, in one way it was very like Greece because at the time, in the 7th century um, and, and the early 6th, we're talking about political system which was called the tyrannies. That actually means that hereditary kingship had been replaced by uh, parvenu, upstart leaders of, of the aristocracy who came into power on popular waves of, of support. And Lesbos is run by uh, tyrants just like the rest of Greece. This meant a lot of aristocratic and business families vying for prominence. And, and there's every reason to believe that Sappho was a member of one of the kind of families who's vying for power and money and status within the eastern Aegean island networks of tyrannies. And they had their own... It was Greek island, but they also they had their own dialect. Was it a dialect which included Greek words, was, was deviated from it based on Greek words? Can you tell us about it? Because obviously in the case of a poet, it's very important. There's three main dialects of ancient Greek, and the one that we mostly uh, hear is, is the one based in Athens. That's what most of the the, the poets people will have heard of wrote in. Um, Sappho's is called Aeolic and it's very, very rare. There are very few poets that we've got. We've got very few examples of of texts in this dialect. She's really our our main representative along with a male poet of the same era called Alceus. And it's very, very exquisite on the ear. It sounds very different in some ways from um, mainland Greek. In particular, the openness of the vowels, the um, E sounds in, in, in Athenian Greek become very often R sounds in uh, the, Sapphic, the, the Aeolic dialect. Was the Aeolic dialect understood by people who had an Ionian dialect, as in Athens, or the Doric dialect, as in Sparta? They could all understand each other, I think. I think it's um, uh, like um, somebody <laughs> from south of England going up to Scotland. <laughs> they may have some trouble with some specialist items of vocabulary and may have to ask them to speak a bit more slowly but they they share a a basic understanding however it did certainly strike the ear very very differently and was regarded as strange and peculiar and by later antiquity four or five hundred years later I think people had some difficulty understanding it when they read it. Dirk Obbing what role did poetry have at that time in the Greek speaking world and then let's particularise Lesbos? Well ancient Greek lyric poetry was actually song 
Um, what got remembered and what is passed down to us are the words, the lyrics to songs that were actually sung and performed and and uh, remembered. Uh, uh, they could even be danced uh, uh, and performed to the to the lyre. Mele is the Greek word, uh, uh, and it means um, um, a musical song. So it's for us, it's a little bit like opening up a piece of sheet music of an opera and being able to read the words of the aria, but but not the score, let alone hear or see how it would have looked when it was staged. Um, the uh, songs tended to be uh, about special occasions, births, weddings, deaths, um, uh, victories or defeats, uh, partings, uh, and, uh, uh, lo and, and, and love affairs. So they tended to be memorializing uh, of, 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 of these events and conveying what was uh, personal to the, to, to the singer in a situation that was typical and experienced by everybody, maybe by the community. On Lesbos, uh, they were u unique in having a cult site for the performance of this lyric poetry in the center of the island, Mesa, uh, which was held in common by all the cities of the island, in which people worshipped uniquely three gods in a single temple, Zeus, Hera, and Dionysus. Um, uh, they were said to be sunnaoi, sharing a single temple, and they worshipped them together. Uh, this would have been the performance space for the uh, songs that Sappho uh, sung, and uh, it would have been an area in which some of the emotions and issues, political issues, were contested and and, and worked out in the context of worship worship of the gods. So the first fragment of the half Sappho is a, a hymn uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to Aphrodite. Um, and uh, uh, also, unusually, there was a beauty contest, a calisteia uh, held in this, uh, 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 in this sanctuary, in this space, which we hear about from some of uh, Sappho's compatriots, uh, the poet Alcaeus, for example. Two, two questions in one, really. Did poets, or singers, which might be better to say, mind it really, did singers have a special place in that society? Were they part of the established uh, hierarchy and high up the hierarchy? Did you have to have a singer? Did they specialise if you had a wedding or a funeral or death or a party, whatever it was? Well, education consisted mainly in learning the traditional metres and measures and melodies in which the traditional songs had been uh, performed, uh, but we're he in, in with the poets who got remembered, like Sappho and Alcaeus. We're talking about professional composers. Uh, they're even said to have invented new instruments, for example. So these were people who specialized at a very high level of continuing the traditional songs while innovating and in introducing new and exciting uh, uh, melodies. How rare was it for a woman poet? to be so celebrated in her time uh, as Sappho? Well, it would have been famous, it would have been unusual for a woman to achieve the kind of fame that Sappho did, and she did partly through the, her, the notoriety she uh, uh, attracted for the subject she sang about. We do know of many other uh, female poets, some of whom were celebrated, but Aristotle, for example, says that the uh, people of Lesbos honoured Sappho even though she was a woman <laughs> when you're talking about so you're talking about the themes we'll go to Peggy Reynolds for that what are the themes lightly touched on by Dirk but now let's go for it what are the themes that that, that make people raise their Greek eyebrows <laughs> uh, Sappho's main themes are love desire longing loss um, so she's these... not. We, right, I mean, and this is an obvious thing to say, but let's get the obvious out of the way first. There's a great heroic narrative tradition in Greek poetry: great battles, great scenes, great epics. And she cut through all that, and these are individual love poems about her and her love for somebody else. Uh, whether woman. or not they're about her is another question. Is another, I know, the, I know, that's a uh, delicate they, matter on these fragments. Indeed, yes. um, and as Dirk says, they are ceremonial. They're performed, they're ritualised. and I go it's away from my own question, which is much more interesting, which is themes. Themes. OK, so love, desire, loss, 
longing, uh, the beauties of the natural world, uh, the progression of women's lives in particular, as Dirk has said, you know, betrothal, uh, marriage, childbirth, these kinds of themes. But she also, to my mind, writes about poetry. She writes about the construction of poetry. Um, I, I'm thinking of something like, you know, let us not in the house of the mu- in the house of the muses there should be no space for lamentation. But are we ducking what Dirk referred to? And let's let's address it straight on because that's what she's most re- famous for, really. That she was she wrote poems of passionate yes. love about other women. I mean. You haven't said that yet. All right. Well, I'll say it now. <laughs> Good. Um, absolutely, she does. Because uh, fragment one, which Dirk has mentioned, is a hymn to Aphrodite. And Sappho calls herself Sappho in the course of this poem. But the pronouns are feminine. So we know that she, Sappho, a woman, is talking about a woman. And the same thing happens in fragment 31, which is the other really famous um, extract that we have. Um, it's not a complete poem, but it comes down to us from antiquity. And again, it's, it's clearly a woman talking about a woman. And so if you call yourself Sappho, and why did you, did you tell me a few minutes ago that we didn't know that it was about Sappho? Because it is still within this very ritualised, performative so, space. But why should she call owning, her, sorry. She's, she's owning herself as the author of these poems, not necessarily talking about personal experience. Uh, we can't tell from this distance whether it is actually So personal. the po- person who writes the poem, is, we know, is Sappho. She calls this person in the poem Sappho, but you're not sure it's Sappho. There are she's, plenty of poems she's performing where she doesn't. Herself. There are plenty yeah. of poems about, for example, mythical subject matter, aren't there, Peggy? Yes. Where, where Hector she's and not Andromache or but she's mm. taking a personal angle on them. So yeah. that subjective, romantic um, sense about them, but she doesn't call them. There's only a few poems where I she calls herself. I don't. I don't think we need to go for one or the other. I think that the two things, uh, the element of the personal and the element of the performative, can sit quite happily side by side. And the fact that she. I, I, to my mind, names herself like this makes her very attractive to a modern audience because we like the fact that she's claiming the authorship and the sense of herself. But I think in some ways it's denigrating her work to say that it is a purely personal, uh, emotional expression uh, in a sense of overflow of emotion. I, I think it, I never said any of those things. All right. Who's but saying I, those things? I would like to say that. I think that one also leaves within it this element of the performative, the ritualized the very authoritative poet figure speaking. Okay, but can you tell us how unusual it was at the time for a woman to write as straightforward passionately about her love for other women and how that affected her reputation at the time, insofar as one can gather this from, as we've kept saying, the fragments that are that remain? It most definitely affected her reputation. We can't know about her lifetime, but it most definitely affected her reputation in latter times, in latter times in antiquity and in, in modern times. Uh, that has been a major theme that people have picked up on. I have no idea how unusual it would have been in ancient Greece um, because we have so little that comes down to us and we're lucky to have the amount of suffer that we actually have. OK, the, uh, Edith Hall, there's an anecdote about the Athenian statesman Solon when he was, I presume, in a symposium with Plato which refer, in which he refers to Sappho. Can you tell us about that and how you find it significant? Well, Solon said that he wanted to learn a particular poem by Sappho off by heart and then he could die happily. I mean, it was, it was like this ultimate transcendent song that would allow him to pass into death. What's interesting, though, is that he's, he's a very stodgy chap, Solon. He's a poet himself and he's a statesman. He goes around abolishing taxes and, and bringing in new laws. So for somebody as sort of deeply uh, solid and, and, and patriarchal and statesmanlike as Solon to say he likes lesbian <laughs> love poetry <laughs> shows just how popular they were and people did recognise her, her genius. Would, would it be more popular in Plato's Symposium than outside Plato's Symposium, that affection for homoerotic poetry? Yes, and I think the word symposium is so key to everything that we've been saying. I personally believe that women have their own drinking parties, their own um, uh, sessions where they trained young girls in the proper manners appropriate to social behaviour and in proper relationships between women of different ages and that there were plenty of other songs that women sang to each other. The men had loads of them. They heard these wonderful songs by Sappho and they decided to have them at their symposia. So what we very rarely hear about are parallel societies, yes. men's society yes. and the women's society, yes. which we very rarely hear about, which you say might be... Uh, 
uh, similar in mimicking, equal to the men's societies. I mean, Certainly so, in this period of Greek history yeah. in the Eastern Aegean, I think the position of women was probably far freer, especially aristocratic women, um, than it was in, in the famous historical periods of, of Athens. I also believe that... Um, the symposium was a crucial place for quite semi-public training of the next generation of your own sex. Before we go any further, could you give us an idea of what her poetry might have sounded like in the original? Well, dialect? I would so love to be able to sing to an ancient <laughs> pectus. Well, go on, Edith, um, risk everything. She, a pectus, she played both instruments which you strummed with a, a plectron. Some people said she even invented the plectron. And a little Lydian harp called the pectus, which she strummed softly with her fingertips as she sang Poikilotra nata nata prodita, Pai dios doloploke, liso maise, mema saisi medoni, icy damna potnia, tumon ala twi delta, i potacati rota, tasimas. Which means? Deathless Aphrodite on your spangled throne, daughter of many uh, uh, wi- who can weave wiles, daughter of Zeus who can weave wiles, I beg you, I beg you, with my pain in my heart, come here if you've ever come here before and heard my voice and come to help me. And she wants help in motivating the person that she's in love with to love her back. She's summoning the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of of erotic allure, to make her sexy so she can get hold of this other woman. Dirk, I mean, we've returned to the fragments I have in the trailer and in the introduction um, a few times. There's very little left. You said about 1% left, you, you, you think... Well, it, there's a lot of guesses going on here, but you're, the, you're better guesses than anybody, you three, so we'll take that. You discovered a couple of new poems quite recently, a year or two ago, to the delight of the Sapphic world. Uh, you're not going to say where. You got them from a collector who actually uh, is not going to tell you where he got them from, so let's forget all that, and you tell us what the poems were. Well, yes, uh, uh, a year before last, uh, I was uh, shown a papyrus uh, fragment uh, that had been salvaged uh, by a collector from the uh, from a collection formed in the 1950s. He was actually quite o- open about where the fragment uh, uh, came from, and uh, 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 I immediately, well, when I you looked at it, where it came from geographically, or where it came from in terms of one collector to another, from one collector to another. Yeah, but we didn't say where and, he dug and, it up. And it came from from Middle Middle Egypt initially. Uh, Big place, Middle Egypt. In yeah. the, okay. <laughs> It's a real clue. Uh, Thanks for that. Old, old <laughs> we'll rush off that tomorrow morning. <laughs> so come on, tell us what it was. And I, me- I immediately recognised uh, from the uh, uh, layout of the lines three long lines followed by a fourth considerably shorter line uh, from the diction, from the language, and the names in the in the fragment that it was a previously uh, unknown uh, poem by Sappho five stanzas of one just beginning pro- missing probably the beginning uh, stanza uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, so for a couple of months it was uh, just me and a girl named Sappho nothing between me and the text no translation no uh, uh, commentary um, and uh, uh, it was uh, it was like being shipwrecked uh, on a desert island with Marilyn Monroe. Uh, <laughs> it was a delightful experience like to it. decipher this text. No, no spaces between the words. The first line uh, mentioned uh, uh, Caraxos coming with a full ship. Alai trules the Caraxon eltame. And uh, um, already Herodotus tells us that Caraxos was the brother of Sappho and that he spent uh, an immense amount of, uh, of money on an expensive call girl in the Egyptian port of Naucratus. And Surely courtesan might be a little bit more periodic appropriate, but <laughs> never mind, you're the boss. And, uh, uh, and, and, and that uh, Sappho expressed her uh, anxiety and concern uh, over this in a, po- in a, in a poem. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the new uh, uh, poem... Uh, uh, opened up like a switch, a conduit between an early 5th century reader of Sappho's poetry and a, and a 21st century audience. Now, I don't think there's time because we've got so much to discuss to go into the amazing painstaking research that was gone into by you and others about the ink, the papyrus, the dating, the comparisons to make sure this was really the real thing. Uh, but it was, and it is. So there's a lot of stuff there. What does it add to what you 
what you scholars ought have at the moment about Sappho. Well, it, it, although Sappho doesn't uh, mention herself in the poem, she doesn't mention herself by name, she does speak in the first person. She d- addresses another person in the second person who is, who is a female, uh, uh, and it may be one of her girlfriends, but it, there's also a good possibility that it's her mother that she uh, uh, addresses in another uh, fragment that we have. She mentions two of her brothers, w- one of whom is uh, out at sea on a trading mission, so there's a concern over wealth, family wealth, national pride, uh, 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 concerned with his return. And she uh, 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 she says, uh, this is in the hands of the gods. She tells the other person, if you're concerned, you should go to the temple of Hera and have me go there and pray to Hera uh, because uh, fair weather follows on from harsh gales. And uh, uh, then she wishes well for her younger brother, Laracos, hoping that he will uh, soon become a man and that all of their cares will be Sudden, suddenly lifted. So it shows uh, uh, a, w- a woman in her own poetry expressing a woman's uh, uh, concerns over the family's wealth, its security in society, marriage, transition of the uh, of the younger brother to a good family. So it broadens the context of her life considerably. Can I come to you, uh, beg your analysis? Which other poems? Which which are the main poems of these fragments uh, that deserve? closest attention? Well, the, 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 the next important one is definitely Fragment 31, uh, which is, um, that man seems to me like a god. Whoever it is that is sitting next to you and listening to your lovely voice and hearing your beautiful laughter. Um, and then she turns around and starts to think about herself. And whenever I look at you, so it is Sappho, yes, indeed, at looking at this woman. Whenever I look at you, my voice dries in my throat, uh, a fire runs through my veins, uh, sweat pours down from me, and I am close to death. Um, but all can be endured because even a pauper, and it's a fragment uh, that is quoted by Longinus much, much later um, and in an, in an essay on the sublime. So it breaks off there. And what he says in his commentary is that this is the most astonishing description of the physical effects of desire, and it is indeed about a a woman speaking about another woman. Um, And those symptoms of desire have gone into poetry from John Donne to, you know, uh, Christina Rossetti to Sylvia Plath to any kind of pop song you care to mention. Um, so that that is a, a massively important poem in terms of this. So you see a direct line. You've mentioned several people. Let's take John Donne and pop songs okay. uh, from Seth. Well, no, just I'm just trying to get a line. You think that there is a direct line that, that, that people read or heard about that and therefore incorporated it in their own thinking about the poems they would write and therefore it moved to p- uh, uh, songs, uh, popular songs. Yes, there's, the, a, there's a direct transmission really? um, because one can... I mean, in some cases it's made completely explicit. So somebody like Shelley in a poem uh, to Constantia singing, he read Greek. He read Greek as a schoolboy. He would have read such fragments of Sappho as were available. And so it goes directly into it. Sometimes it's attributed, sometimes it's not. But there is a, a, a direct line of reception and transmission through all of these authors. Is there any other poem we can just bring up before we move on slightly that do you think expresses well, her in, in a fuller way than these tantalising fragments? Yeah, I mean, we okay. have what Dirk has discovered, which obviously is a big addition. I like the think. poem that is often called Fragment 16. I don't know about you two, but I like this poem called Fragment 16, which begins saying, some say a host of cavalry or a huge yeah. army um, is the most beautiful sight in the world. But I say it is whatever you desire. She then goes on to Revise kind of Homer because she says this reminds me of Helen who after all left her husband her parents, her child for desire and then she switches again and she says and that reminds me of Anactoria who is not here and I would rather see her shining face than all the armies of Lydia and that interestingly reminds me of something that Edith said earlier about the symposium because Sappho in these such fragments as we have names herself but the other wonderful thing from my point of view is she names other women 
you know, these lost women who lived these lives in ancient Greek, whose lives are otherwise so hidden to us. She names Anactoria, she names Athos, she names Gorgo, she names... There are Gongilla. L- Gongilla, that's right. Um, and, uh, you know, these, these names uh, come down to us in this way. Thank you very much. Edith, Edith Hall, we mentioned her reputation um, as the poetess, or it was mentioned. How did, if you can, can you, um, as it were, ripple through the next few centuries, how it changed? We, we, we've talked about references in antiquity, we've talked about Plato's Symposium, we've got into Roman stuff with Catullus and Horace and so on. What then happened? Okay, the poems didn't survive in the tradition of of being copied out in manuscripts after the advent of Christianity if they were regarded as not suitable for educating young men. So although there was still a complete set of her poems in Alexandria in the 3rd century BC, by the 4th century AD and the triumph of Christianity, um, people weren't reading Sappho as part of their education. That's why we lost almost all of her. To add an insult to injury, uh, I mean, Pope Gregory VII um, allegedly took out what, what did remain of her from, from, from the library in, in, in uh, Byzantium and burnt it publicly mm. because it was regarded so as so immoral. So Christianity was against Sappho because, because of the... Because smut. it was rude. Yeah, because of what <laughs> they regarded as, as the disgusting tribadism. The word tribadism is found in some of the early um, ancient texts. It means this... Uh, woman who rubs something. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> rude word about, about lesbian sexual habits. And this became uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, main objection to her. And you find once the Renaissance happens, Sappho's first printed in 1555, that very often translations tried to mask these pronouns so that it could mm. be songs about men. I mean, that, that's quite consistent all the way through, really, until the translation of Longinus by Boileau, which is what uh, everybody in the literary world reads and really brings Sappho in the late 17th century to uh, the eyes of everyone. And ever since then, she's been thoroughly contested as to whether she uh, was a schoolmistress or uh, just using sex as a metaphor or, or what. You know, that has become the questionable topic. Can we d- <coughs> dwell on this a little, Bobbing, please? Because there are, um, <coughs> Edith outlined it, so we've got a very good overview. But can we go into some of the details of why she was, uh, uh, as, let's say, neglected or lost, both of those things, and th- that you only have 1% left? Well, Sappho was difficult to, for one, for one <coughs> thing. The Aeolic dialect uh, fell into into disuse. It wouldn't have been easy for Roman period readers to read Sappho. We know from the papyrus remains they couldn't read her without a commentary beside her, and it was uh, it, it was hotly debated what some of the uh, what some of the poems meant, uh, uh, what her uh, uh, sexual orientation was 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 clear enough, but the social setting in which they they had been it had been expressed was uh, was lost. And people really only had the language and, and diction and, and, and metaphors, the topoi of lyric poetry to study and to go on. And for a while, it was part of the school tradition. There was a very fine edition of her poems produced, as you said, in nine books uh, to Alexandria, organized by some of them by meter. All of the, the of the first book were in the meter of the sapphic stanza. Um, uh, uh, and and very highly worked over to root out uh, details, uh, errors that had creeped in through the oral tradition and the recording tradition and then through the later copying tradition. So it was produced to a very high level and that's what we have remains of in the papyrus tradition. And for a while she was part of the school t- tradition, but as Christianity and a new curriculum took over a different ethos, uh, uh, a different set of uh, moral criteria for selection of works for copying and transmission. Uh, uh, she fell in into uh, disuse. But that said, there is some evidence that she could uh, be read in Byzantine Constantinople uh, uh, in in whole roles. Uh, Christian book burnings uh, notwithstanding. There are also (laughs) mechanical reasons that she didn't survive any work that didn't get itself copied sufficiently Mm. uh, in sufficient numbers from the papyrus roll into the codex by about the 6th century AD didn't survive to be copied into the uh, Middle Ages. We have only one uh, manuscript of Sappho fragments uh, on a parchment codex of the 6th century AD. So there simply weren't enough to launch her into 
uh, uh, the the the, uh, the Renaissance, uh, which would have appreciated the classical models in her uh, writing and perpetuated them. Yes, but nevertheless, uh, Peggy Reynolds, in the Rena later Renaissance, as, as Edith has said, the interest in her was awakened. Where did that? Do we know specifically where that came yes, from? Yes, it comes from a very early publication, as Edith mentioned, of the uh, a translation of. Uh, Longinus's treatise on the sublime which quotes fragment 31 of Sappho uh, almost in full possibly um, and the other work is uh, Dionysus of, of Halicarnassus who quotes fragment 1 the Ode to Aphrodite so called in a book on literary composition um, so these works start being translated and printed and disseminated and so Sappho comes back into uh, the, the, the realm of knowledge and interestingly well, although Edith is absolutely right in saying, you know, that early translators like by John Addison or Ambrose Phillips turn uh, Fragment 31 into a boy talking about a girl rather than a girl talking about a girl, people still knew that something else was going on. So John Donne's poem, Sappho to Philoneus, is definitely a rude poem about two girls doing <laughs> lots and lots of rubbing, I imagine, as Edith says. Right. Now then... <laughs> Let's go to the Enlightenment and get away from all this rude talk. Uh, enlightenment. What did the Enlightenment make of uh, Sappho's sexuality? Were they, did they not think it was rude? Well, actually, um, there's a particular French uh, scholar called Anne Dacier mm. in the late 17th, early 18th century who manages to imply that Sappho is, is part of a sort of literary coterie. Um, uh, this is the time of the ladies' salons in France and she produces an extraordinarily important French version and because she was a respectable married woman herself uh, a widow in fact by this time it's uh, it was seen as, as as sort of putting the stamp on this as respectable having said that um, I think that always goes with a slight countercultural mm. tendency people who like Sappho very often are slightly on the bohemian and edge yeah. of, of, of uh, society or they have been people who've had to have covert homosexual lives, or they've been feminists because she is the first great female um, yeah. poet. I'd like to pick up on that because the point where this becomes absolutely crucial is the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, when many, many intellectual women identified themselves with Sappho. You know, across Europe there was the British Sappho, there was the Russian Sappho, there was the German Sappho, you know. And I'm thinking of two people in particular, Mary Robinson, who in England... Uh, was an actress. She was the mistress of the Prince of Wales. She writes a long sonnet sequence called Sappho to Fion, but she also writes a pamphlet about women's rights, and she's a friend of Mary Wollstonecraft. And okay. in Europe, you have uh, Germaine de Stael, Madame de Stael, who uh, composes a, a novel called Corinne, or Italy, but she's a kind of Sappho figure. She is a performing intellectual woman. Um, so these women... Uh, incorporate Sappho into their works um, but there is a bohemian element to it always uh, Dirk Obbing lots of uh, anecdotes which turned into myths which were perhaps mere rumours which were sometimes fantasies gather around Sappho, one of which is that she threw herself off a cliff at the end of her life, a high cliff in Greece uh, because of the unrequited love for a man called Phaon. Now, where did that come from, and why did it hang around? Well, we know there was a, a, a myth on the island of Lesbos of an, a ferryman, an old ferryman who uh, carried people across the uh, uh, strait to Asia Minor. And uh, uh, Sappho, we sung in a, in, a, in a poem about how uh, Aphrodite appeared to him as an old woman, and he ferried her across at her request and didn't charge her anything. And in return, Aphrodite made him into a young and beautiful uh, uh, young man and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and fe fell in love with him. And I think it's pretty long been realized that this is a replication of the myth of Adonis, uh, who is associated with Aphrodite in women's, uh, in, in women's worship. Adonis then dies through the uh, over, o overwhelming uh, power of, of contact with Aphrodite, and the women collectively lament uh, for Adonis. So uh, a, the references in ancient auth authors suggest that uh, Phaon was kind of stand-in, maybe even a pseudonym for uh, uh, Adonis, and that Sappho expressed uh, uh, 
personal or collective lamentation for him for him uh, in in a poem and described herself uh, as uh, 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 being overwhelmingly in, in in love with him on the point of death as she does in a number of other her other fragments in fragment ninety five she says I'm so close to death I can see the shores of Acheron uh, uh, for example to a uh, common topos in Aphrodite. But in this case, it looks like clearly uh, uh, Sappho identified herself with Aphrodite. And we see this in a number of the other fragments or identified one of the beloved as uh, 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 as Aphrodite, as an ex- sort of expression or embodiment of desire. At the end of fra- uh, fragment one, she asks Aphrodite to be her fellow fighter in battle, Sumacos. She identifies so closely with her. And this seems to have give, given uh, uh, ancient readers the impression that Sappho had a love affair with Baton, and Ovid wrote, uh, or pseudo-Ovid wrote a uh, one of the heroides about uh, Sappho dying uh, uh, out of love for Faron. Can we just can we just go a bit uh, more in a little more detail to her uh, adoption by the women's movement? What uh, we talked about, you've talked about Mary Robinson, referred to Mary Robinson, you've referred to Mary uh, uh, Wilson Craft, Madame de Stael, and so on. What are they adopting? Well, they're adopting the right of, of, of women to poetic expression mm. or any kind of expression at all. Because from antiquity in general, we have you know, fewer women's voices, direct women's voices, than you can count on the fingers of your, 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 your fingers and your toes. I mean, there are hardly any women who speak to us directly from pagan antiquity. They're almost always mediated or quoted by male authors so there is something incredibly thrilling um, for me as as a woman to hear say the brother's poem about this woman complaining about holding up the family business with these two you know feckless brothers it it, it, it makes you feel very um, makes us all feel as though you know we have a stake in antiquity so is it just the fact that it's a woman coming out of a golden age of culture and poetry or is this woman saying something that is particularly relevant to Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Robinson at the time she is because she's claiming poetic authority and actually this yeah. sense of women claiming Sappho starts in antiquity Gnosis of Lockery writes a poem saying if you go to Lesbos uh, to Myrtilene of the lovely dancers say hello to Sappho for me, you know, and and Mary Wollstonecraft and and, and Madame de Stael and all these, Christina Rossetti, all these other poets who subsequently impersonate her or take over her voice to some degree are similarly, as Edith says, celebrating the fact that here is a woman with authority working within a recognised cult who uh, wants to be claimed and recognised as a poet, as an artist, as a creative artist. And because of her fragmentary survival, she could even be claimed by male poets as a figure of, a figure of authority, as Pound, for example. Yes, because he writes a lovely little poem called Spring, Too Long, Gongula. Exactly. And that's it. That's why I say Gongula. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but also met for gay male poets she has been extraordinarily important um you find there's a whole you know all the way through um oscar wilde uh, 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 numerous 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 poets who weren't able necessarily kavafis the great greek yes. poet uh, is massively influenced by her descriptions of of, of 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 tender love on 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 warm perfumed coverlets in the sort of aegean sunset this sort of uh, sensuality and in fact, some of the best metrical imitations, Allen Ginsberg uh, has done the best ever poem in, in modern sapphic metres. He uses the very metre when he's talking about his red cheeked boyfriends mm. tenderly kissing sweet mouth. And everybody who knows anything about erotic literature knows just through that metre that he's talking about um, a slightly covert or, or illegitimate love affair with somebody of his own sex. Now, uh- Dirk, how, what are the, we're getting towards the end of time, but can you be succinct? What are the chief difficulties in translating what you find of Sappho? Because I've got a book of her stuff here, and most of it is lines, <laughs> meaning, I mean, just a line of words, <laughs> just a line. Saying <laughs> that There should be words here, but there isn't. Uh, the, most of it is gaps. I've got a book of gaps with some words in by Sappho. <laughs> now, <laughs> so you've got that in front of you. That makes it quite tricky, doesn't it? Yes, I mean, we have to apply all the skills of modern science to try to put the text back together as far as possible. And the papyrus fragments and quotations in ancient authors and parallels in other lyric poetry do allow us to assemble a kind of skeleton of some of the poems without being able to see the full shape of the 
of 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 the uh, of of the body. The, um, one of the difficulties is it leads to the impression that all of her poetry had a kind of fragmentary style, mm. and it, it simply didn't. The poems were composed to be read and 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 understood as wholes. The difficulty is that because we we a know so little about her and b have so little of her work. Um, per- perversely, that's one reason why she is so enormously attractive. Because you can pour into her, into this empty space that is called Sappho, that begins with an S and ends with an O, um, all your own ideas and all your own desires. Uh, and that's exactly what's happened to her. For me, the big problem is, is you know, uh, what Emily Dickinson said, I know it's a poem when it blows the top of my head off. We know from everybody in antiquity that it blew their heads off. So it's very easy to get hold of your big Greek dictionary and do a lexical version that is so boring and so stodgy and so pedantic. You've got to get a poet who can really um, express that star-spangled, yeah. sexy style that just leaves you breathless as Sappho was. Which she does. But whatever you say about it being tantalising that there's so little... It's also sort of annoying that there's so little. It's a bit like we really know about 5% of the universe and now they're having a go with the New Hadron Collider to get hold of dark energy and dark matter and the other but 90%, the bizarre... 95% will be all revealed. Do you think if the other 99% of Sappho is revealed, something different will turn up? I think I, this is what's so exciting about these new papyrus finds. The further away we get from Sappho in time, bizarrely, the closer we are getting in with these papyrus well, to her work. I mean, if you look at the end of the 19th century before the papyrus, finds there were really just only a handful of quotations in ancient authors that were in editions of of, of Sappho and the papyrus finds have exp- expanded that uh, to the, the 200 the some fragments that are in 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 modern editions new progress uh, continues to be made just on those alone putting the fragments back together into whole poems and there's every reason to think that there is lurking in other papyrus in, in, collections, in, in, Middle Egypt. in particular, <laughs> well, particularly in little accessed collections, yeah. uh, uh, like in the museum in Cairo and in Moscow and Saint Petersburg, and it's that there's exciting. more of Sappho waiting to see light. Well, we hope so. Thank you very much. Then we do another program about the other ninety, whatever it is. Thank you very much, Henry. Edith Hall, Peggy Reynolds, and Dirk Opping. Next week we'll be talking about Matteo Ricci, a Jesuit priest of the 16th century, went on a Christian mission to China and met up with the leaders of the Ming Dynasty. Thank you very much for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. I hope you enjoyed it. Did you enjoy it? Very much so. Very okay. much so. Thank you. It's not often we get to <laughs> talk about this stuff. I know, I know, I know, I know. Tell me what you didn't get to talk about. Go okay, on. I want to well, talk yes, about the two Sappos. You want to talk about the two Sappos? Oh, yes. Well, there's, there's, yeah. the Eris, there's the one from Erisus and the one from Mertolini. The, the ancients got so confused about whether she was a, a, a sussy little prostitute or the most exquisite lyric poet of all time mm. that they decided there were two Sappos. Yeah. One from Erisos. And one from Mertolini. That's right. <laughs> Do you agree that there were two? That there might have been two? Not at all. Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> well, why didn't you say that on the programme? Then we could have because talked... You, because you didn't love the question of the script as ever, Melvin. You're allowed to. <laughs> you... <laughs> I mean, I didn't love it as ever, you mean. Well, anyway, I think, I think that's a bit too confusing. I mean, because it's very... It seems to me, given that there is so much in terms of transmission and reception, yeah. it seems to me absolutely crucial to talk about the real Sappho, you know, yeah. to put the actual... Yes, Poems the, back. the interesting thing about the division is there's some evidence that she was like the uh, the, the slutty Sappho from from Erosos because people did associate her with the drinking party mm. and the excitement and we of never talked the about what... of the uh, uh, of eroticism that flourished yeah. in the drinking in the drinking party. So there is it's not as though that Sappho doesn't exist and no, it's no. only the high class Sappho from Mytilene. They're both present. Mm. Yeah. I, the one poem I really wanted to get in and didn't was, uh, was the other one that we've managed to complete, which is because uh, it gives us the elderly Sappho. Oh yes, yeah. the looking, clone. Yeah, looking back on um, look at, looking with at, her bad knees. She wants to dance. So she used to be able to dance like a fawn. Well, you can moan about what you didn't get in. I, <laughs> I read this. Uh, look at all those clicks. I didn't get any of my clicks in. Oh, all the clicks. That I, that I think that here, I, I really like that click, translation. Click, 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 I think click, click, Anne click. Carson's translation is so yes. good. That's the one that blows your yeah. head off. Yeah, it is because yeah. she puts back she 
She she makes it spiky somehow or other again. Well, she's a yes, poet. Uh, uh, although yeah. uh, when the Tithonus poem was published, that was the uh, uh, second most recent new find, a poem mm. about comparing Sappho in her old age to Tithonus, who is yeah. allowed by his divine wife Aos to get just get old and old and old till he lost his voice, but he still has a divine wife. She says <laughs> at the end of the poem and. Uh, 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 when that uh, poem was published, it combined with a previously published fragment of the same uh, poem, but only the line beginnings. And and Anne Carson said after it was published that she actually preferred the first <laughs> version, uh, the more fragmentary version, because it mentioned a fawn. She says, my uh, uh, my knees are no longer as nimble as, as fawns and can't dance. Uh, and she said she actually preferred it when it just referred to the fawn as a symbol of sexuality. Want to <laughs> the brilliant thing about that poem, though, and it's very, very, very interesting to me, is that it does not gender identify the speaker. Mm. It's the only substantial one we've got that doesn't. Or even reverses. To compare it to, to the arguably with the yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. So that is a poem that a man could have sung. So there's some man. Um, for- uh, and it's, it, you wouldn't have been able to identify he was singing in a female persona. And I suspect there was a lot more of that that we haven't got. Or that the poems were yeah. read or even composed to be attractive to the expression of desire for a female by you a male, male audience. Yeah. You think there is a lot more recoverable papyrus? Or is that a hope? A fantasy. It's, Stuart, not please, only, please. it's not only hope. I mean, the recent discoveries have, have, have borne it I think borne there it must out. be. Uh, it's just a case of finding it, as you say. <laughs> Dirk <laughs> he has the boxes you never know you never know <laughs> well exactly you're still working through Oxyrhynchus so here's Simon the producer who's going to offer us what do you, what do you offer I think tea or coffee <laughs> <laughs> there are many more Radio 4 arts and discussion programmes to download for free find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio 4